Do y'all remember back in the late 90s, some of you weren't even born yet, but do y'all remember the rubber bracelets that said WWJD on them? Who remembers that? Raise your hand. All right. Yeah, you're a bunch of old people. All right. <laughs> WWJD. Uh, very, very, very popular. A rubber band, just kind of like what I got on with the All In campaign. And it stood for What Would Jesus Do? Now, we, we think that was a, you know, turn of the century thing, you know, that, but it wasn't. Actually, the roots of WWJD started in 1896. And, uh, and it started by a Topeka, Kansas pastor uh, who uh, wrote a little book called In His Steps. And in that book, uh, he asked a question. He said, you know, with, with everything we do all during the day and everything that we face in life, it'd be a good idea that whatever circumstance you're in, to probably ask yourself before you do anything, what would Jesus do? What would he do in that circumstance? How would he, how would he think about this? How would he react with this? How would he act about this? And, uh, and so it's a great question. Uh, what would Jesus do? Uh, I am a golf fan. Do you have any golf fans in the house? Let me hear it. All right. Okay. Four of you. All right. And I know what you think. You say, well, golf is not a real sport. <laughs> All right. But anyway, Shakespeare said this about golf to golf or not to golf. That is a stupid question. All right. So anyway, well, he really didn't say that, but he should have. Uh, now one of my, one of my, my favorite golfers is a man by the name of Payne Stewart. Now Payne Stewart ended up becoming a strong believer in the Lord Jesus. Now in the 1999, uh, U S open, that was right here at Pinehurst, just less than an hour away. Uh, I had the privilege of going to a practice round and I followed Payne Stewart around and uh, he's a great guy. And I noticed that while he was playing that he had on a rubber bracelet with WWJD on it. What would Jesus do? And I knew he was a strong believer. And uh, so that year he won the US Open, 1999 at Pinehurst. And it was an awesome thing. Well, several months later, he and a couple of guys had chartered a Learjet and they were flying. And when they got way above altitude, for some reason, the oxygen went out and they all passed out and they all died while they were in midair. And the plane traveled for 1500 miles with no pilot. It was on autopilot. If you remember back then, they sent out the Air Force to kind of, uh, you know, guard the plane. They were going to shoot the plane down if it was going to head toward a major city to crash because they knew it was going to run out of fuel eventually. And it did after 1500 miles and it crashed in a, in an open field and everybody on board was already dead, but everything was obliterated. I mean, they couldn't hardly, they couldn't identify the bodies or anything, but it's really, really strange that one item that they found was Payne Stewart's rubber WWJD bracelet. It was still intact. Well, a couple of years later, down at Pinehurst, celebrating uh, the, uh, the U.S. Open victory. And, and, and when Payne Stewart hit that last putt to win the U.S. Open, which he had lost the year before just by one stroke, then he, he kind of did that as a celebration. I mean, he's just it like that. Well, they caught that picture and they called that picture one moment in time. And so in Pinehurst, they erected a statue in honor of Payne Stewart. I think it's, it's on the screen. You can see it. Uh, you can go down there and uh, I've been there several times. By the way, nobody goes down there standing by that statue unless you do that. All right. Uh, but I want you to notice if you, if you don't notice already, if you look on his right hand, you're going to see a bracelet. It's in stone. It's in bronze. And on that bracelet is the initials WWJD. And it will be there for all of time. What would Jesus do? It's a great question. It has to do with the heart of Jesus. What's the heart of Jesus? What would Jesus do in your circumstance? And what you're facing and what you're facing today and what you're facing tomorrow, what would Jesus do? But what I want to do for the next couple of weeks is I want to turn that around. And I don't want to ask what would Jesus do. But I want to ask the question for the next couple of weeks, what are some things that Jesus would undo in our life? We all know that there are things in our life that, that God would really like to undo. Some things that we practice or the things that we fail to do that we ought to do. What would Jesus undo in our life? And that too is a great question. So we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to look at that uh, for the next uh, several weeks. Yeah, has anybody, you ever given somebody a gift and you put a lot of time into it? And, uh, and you were very excited about them opening the gift because you knew how much time you put in. You, you, you thought they would really love it. They opened the gift and just kind of rolled their eyes and set it aside to open up something else. Now, when, when, as parents, when my kids were young, 
uh, they would kind of do that. There would be something they'd really ask for or whatever, and then you'd give them the gift, and they'd end up playing with the box. I mean, can anybody you know what I'm talking about? Any parents know what I'm talking about? So just skip the, give them a box. Can I get an amen? All right. And, and but it kind of you, you buy somebody a gift, and you put some time into it, and they just kind of set it aside. It kind of hurts. Well, think about all the gifts that Jesus has given us. Am I talking to anybody today that's been blessed by God? Let me hear a big amen, all right? We, we've all been blessed. We've all been blessed by God. I mean, think about it. Jesus left heaven's glory. He, volu- he was, he's the third person of the Trinity. He's before creation and he left heaven's glory and he became a man, but not just any man. He didn't become a king. He didn't become a prince. He became a servant. Uh, he was born uh, of a virgin in a manger, lowly. And he left heaven's glory and, 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 he, and he died for our sin. He went all the way to the cross. The Bible said he was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And he forgave us of our sin. And on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he paid for our sin. And not only that, not only does he guarantee me salvation and a home in heaven, but the Bible says I'm also a joint heir with Christ. And all of these wonderful, wonderful things that God has done for us. And how dare we just sit there roll our eyes as if, eh, whatever, whatever. Now, now you would think after the uh, victorious Sunday that we had last week, I wouldn't be preaching anything like this, but you know, many of you who are soldiers and do battle, you know that the, the greatest time for an enemy to attack is after a big battle. And so we had a great Sunday last year, but I, I want to remind us about the warning of spiritual indifference. If Jesus would undo undo anything in our life, the first thing I think Jesus would undo is spiritual indifference. Just a guy go, well, whatever. It's church, church, I'm gonna go to church. I'm gonna do it, been there, done that. Uh, And Jesus tells us, the book of Revelation, that not only does it break his heart, listen to me, you listen to me say amen, amen, but it makes him sick, makes him sick. I'm not making this up. We're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna look at it. Everybody take your Bible and, and turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation in chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, turn your Bible on, flip it on. The words are going to be on the screen as well, but I want you to see something. Now, in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus sends a personal letter to seven churches throughout Asia Minor, to the pastors of those churches. Can you imagine Jesus himself walking in here, handing me a letter? And, and he said, read the letter to Aaron Lake Baptist Church, and I'd lead it, and, you know, it, it's an eye-opener. And so, uh, so he writes these, these, this letter in chapter 2 and chapter 3. He writes these letters to the seven churches throughout Asia Minor. Uh, there's a church at Ephesus that, is, uh, that lost its first love. Church at Smyrna, the persecuted church. Uh, the church at Pergamos, the compromising church. There's a church at Thyatira, the corrupt church. Church at Sardis, which is the dead church. The church at Philadelphia, which is the faithful church. And then the last one is a church at Laodicea, uh, the lukewarm uh, church. Now, some people believe and some people teach that these seven churches represent seven timelines throughout history so that we can kind of gauge where we are on God's scheme of things so we'll know how close we are to Jesus' return. And if that's true, then we're at the last church age, which is the lukewarm church church. And you know it's true. I mean, church is not even on people's radar hardly anymore. Uh, faithful people come maybe once a month and say, you know what? I'm faithful. And, and the paradigm has shifted dramatically in the last five years. And so Jesus addresses this lukewarm church. Now, here, here's the thing about all of those churches. He does two things. He gives a, a commendation, the things that they're doing well. And then he gives them a condemnation, the things they're not doing well. In other words, if Jesus were to come in here and write a letter and I was to read it, I'm pretty sure that there would be some things. He would say, you know what, Aaron Lake, here's some things you're doing well. But also, on the other hand, he would say, Aaron Lake, here's some things you're not doing well, a commendation and a condemnation. But when it comes to the lukewarm church, when it comes to the church of Laodicea, there is no commendation whatsoever. It's only a condemnation about their lukewarmness. Now, Let's go to Revelation uh, chapter, chapter 3. Uh, Laodicea, which is the church this was written to, was a major city. Now, if you've ever been to a city in antiquity, uh, you, 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 people think that people that lived in ancient times were, you know, they were just mesmerized by fire. 
You know, they just grunted. They didn't know how to commit. Nothing could be farther from the truth. They were major cities. Matter of fact, you'd be blown away. And I've, and I've been on many occasions where you'd be blown away at how modern these cities were. I mean, they had malls, they had shops, uh, they had communication systems, they had indoor plumbing. I mean, it is amazing. So, so this was a very modern city, a very large city, but three, about 30 years before this letter was written to this church, they'd gone through a major earthquake. And so they started to rebuild. And when they started to rebuild, they started to rebuild with an abandon. I mean, they really were bent. People were coming by the droves to this major city. Well, in any major city, when you start getting an influx of new people, you got a water problem. And so they had to pipe in water. Now, in, in biblical times, in those ancient times, they didn't pipe in water because they didn't have pumps, they didn't have their pumps, but they had aqueducts. And you've seen pictures of them. They're usually stone, they're usually way up high, and they bring water down from the mountains. And so there were two major cities that the city of Laodicea had to get water from. The first one was Colossae. Colossae is the, the church where, you, where Paul wrote a letter called Colossians to it. Now, Colossae was famous for its cool water, its drinking water. Uh, it, was, it, it, was, it was beautiful water. But then it was, wasn't enough, so they had to pipe in water from another city called Heropolis. And, and by the way, Heropolis is a real city. It's not where superheroes live. Can you get an amen? All right. So, so they had this city called Heropolis, but Heropolis was known for its hot springs. Heropolis was the place where people would go, kind of like Palm Springs, where they would sit, you know, in hot water, uh, bubbling water, and it would heal them and relax them. So both waters had great purpose to them. The problem was, is that when they piped in with aqueducts, these two cities and the two waters would merge, then what you would get at the end was not cold water and it was not hot water, it was lukewarm water. And lukewarm water does nobody any good. It doesn't cool people off, it doesn't quench their thirst, and it doesn't heal anybody. And so Jesus uses this illustration that this major city had to live with every day as an illustration of where they were spiritually. So we got to keep that in mind. Revelation chapter three, beginning at verse 15, Jesus says, I know your works. Everybody say that with me. I know your works." Now, by the way, this is as elementary as it gets, but how many of you know, Jesus knows everything you do. Now, sometimes we forget that. Now we expect, uh, Miss Phyllis in the, in the preschool department to teach our preschoolers that Jesus knows everything you do. But we tend to forget as we grow up as if Jesus is concentrating on somebody else. No, he knows everything we do. And here's the thing about Jesus. Not only does he know everything this church does, not only does he know everything I do, not only does he know everything you do, but what we got to understand is he knows the motivation behind what you do. You see, some people can fool everybody. I mean, they look good on the outside, man. You just, but Jesus knows why we do what we do. Not only what we do, but why we do what we do. So he said, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. And I wish you were cold or hot. In other words, he said, both serve his purpose, but you're not serving any purpose. You're not cooling anybody off. You're not refreshing anybody. And you're not healing anybody. You're doing no good for anybody. So then, verse 16, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's a, that's a strong statement. Listen, Jesus said, listen, your lukewarmness, your spiritual indifference, you're not doing anybody any good is not only breaking my heart, but it's making me sick to my stomach. That Jesus, I mean, he's saying it to the church. He's, he's, not, he's not saying that to the pedophile. Uh, he's, not, he's not saying that to the murder and the pimp and the prostitute. He's saying it to the church. Now, understand that. And he said, you're just making me sick to my stomach. Lukewarmness to do that. Well, first of all, let me give you two causes of spiritual indifference. Number one, write this down. You ought to take notes on this. This series would be a good series to take notes on. Number one, two causes of spiritual indifference. Number one, the illusion of self-sufficiency. That's the first cause. We got it made. We, we, are, we are blessed by God. Now listen to what he said. Look at verse 17. Because you say, I'm rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, we live in that day. Am I talking to anybody that understands we have been blessed by God? Everybody in this room, I don't care what your financial situation is, compared to the rest of the world, we are rich. And somebody give God a hand clap of praise for that because that is absolutely true. Amen? We're rich. Turn to the person right beside you and say, I'm rich. Go ahead. See, you don't want to do that because nobody, nobody's rich. Nobody, nobody thinks they're rich. You don't, you don't want to do that. Listen, I'm up here in front of finance committee members right now telling you I'm rich. And I know they're probably going to say, well, we'll do something about that. But anyway, so I'm telling you I'm rich and you're rich. We've been blessed by God and all God's people said. I'm telling you, I'm telling you this, the last couple of weeks, all I've had is first world problems. We went on vacation to Myrtle Beach. Come on, Myrtle Beach. We went to Myrtle Beach. And, uh, but, but while we were gone, lightning must have struck our house. Y'all had a big storm. We, we didn't have, we were at Myrtle Beach, man. We were chilling. And, uh, but y'all must have had a big storm because when we got back, everything was out. My TVs were out. Did you notice I said TVs? I don't have one TV, brother. I got, I got TVs all over the place. My, my refrigerator, my refrigerator was out. All of that meat, all of that stuff spoiled. It was, it was horrible. And, and by the way, let me tell you this. I got refrigerators, not refrigerator. You don't get this by one refrigerator. Can you get an amen? Amen. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, you got to have more refrigerator. To keep this machine running. Meat went bad. Food went bad. Refrigerators out. TVs are out. Lights are out. I mean, all of it. But it's first world problems. I got TVs. I got a refrigerator. Most of you, you have a car problem. Oh, you just gripe and complain because you got a car problem. And the rest of the world would say, oh, you have a car? Not only do you have a car, you have a house to keep your car in. And if you don't keep your car in that little garage house, you fill it up with stuff. Can I get an amen? Amen. And then you have a yard sale to sell your stuff, to get money to go out and buy more stuff so you can have a yard sale to sell that stuff. (laughs) Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's who we are. Jesus was saying, listen, I blessed you. And you're, but here's, here's the problem. If you're not careful, you're going to, I'll bless you so much. You're going to think you don't need me. And you're going to think I'm rich. And you're going to think I'm in need of nothing. I'm telling you right now, you hear that all the time. You go ahead. You invite people. Invite people to church. You know what they'll say? They'll say, oh, that's good for you, but that ain't my thing. That ain't my thing. I don't need that. That's good for you. You go ahead. And Jesus was saying, look, you may see yourself that way. You see, some of you right now are in the spring of your life. And I mean, everything's going good, man. I mean... You're going good. I mean, you, you, fought, you get to live in the South. Come on. I love the South where the men are men and the women are men. I mean, I just love that. I mean, you know, I just, <laughs> can I get an amen? I mean, you know, just love the South. Hold your emails. Come on. I'm not even going to check my Facebook page today. I'm just saying. But Jesus said, look. You see yourself that way. You're in the spring of your life. You think you got it all together. You think you got it all. You're all that. Jesus said, let me, see how, let me show you how I view you. I view you as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's how I see you. When you have spiritual indifference, you don't have it all together. You think you can take me or leave me. You go to church. If you do go to church, you look at your watch, you roll your eyes. They've been there, done that. Don't have any need of anything. I'm good. I'm good to go. Preacher, preach to somebody that needs it. I'm good. Jesus, no, no, you need it. I need it. We all need it. Can I get an amen? amen? The second thing is distractions of this world. Not only the riches of this world, but distractions of this world. In Mark chapter 4, and you don't have time to turn to it, but in Mark chapter 4, Jesus gives this parable of the sower that goes out and sows seed, and the seed was the word of God. And the seed was falling on different kinds of soils, and the soils represented different kinds of hearts. And some, some soil was good, and the seed, the Word of God took root. Some, you know. But look what he said. I'll just, I'll just read it to you. You can probably see it on the screen. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 19. Listen to what he said. And the cares of this world, 
That's the worries of this world. That's the stress of this world. That's what so many of you are living under right now. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the deceitfulness, think you got it, I got this. I'm good. I'm good to go. The deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things entered in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. You know, this is the story of our life. Life's stressful. I mean, it is. Here's what happens. I come up here, man, I'll preach my heart out. We'll sing our heart out. I mean, it's, it's awesome. I love this place. I really do. And, uh, and, and I think you receive it. I, I, you know, sometimes we try to have to pull things out of you because if you think I look miserable up here, you ought to see some of y'all. I mean, really, I mean, it's just sad. But anyway, but we enjoy it. Come on. How many of you enjoy Airlay Baptist Church? Amen. Yeah, we enjoy it. But what happens is I'll preach, we'll sing, we'll have a great time. But then life gets in the way. You know, Monday, life hits. And we're stressed out. And, and you hear it all the time. People say, you know what? You know what? You know what I want? When I get home, I don't, want, I don't want to worry about anything. I don't want anything. I just want to chill. I just want to chill. That's, that's, that's kind of watchword. You, you didn't know I knew that word, did you? I, you know where I get that word from? From my grandkids. I, listen, I, got, I got a 10-year-old grandkid. Last time they, they were there, they were just, I said, come on, guys. Hey, we got a tree house out back. We got a pool. All right, let's get out. Let's go outside. Let's do something. Let's go outside. Don't do virtual reality. Let's do reality reality. And they'll say, well, Papa, I just want to chill. Just chill. Chill? Well, you got to chill over, Papa. I mean, you got parents that love you. Parents that are working their tail off for you. And I know you got awesome grandparents, because I am one. Can I get an amen, all right? Well, I just want to chill. You know what my grandpa said? He said, he said well, Pastor, you, I mean, uh, uh, Papa, you don't understand. It's my teacher. My teacher's got it in for me. She don't like me. She's got it in for me. And that'd be okay, except that kid's homeschooled. I mean, you know, so, yes. <laughs> Come on, I had you, didn't I? That's, just want to see if you're listening. <laughs> I had y'all going, man. Uh, but it's true. We just, we just want to chill. I mean, we don't, our plates are doggone full. It's distractions of the world. And what happens is, those distractions will choke the Word of God. You know, you're so distracted, you don't even have time to get into the Word of God, let alone be choked uh, or, or, or get the Word of God into you. And so... Jesus said, listen, yeah, Laodicea, you're busy. You're a busy city. You're a modern city. You have modern life. You have a busy life. You got it going. But you're poor, miserable, wretched, blind, naked, and the distractions of life are choking the word of God out of your life. Uh, so now, how do you know if you're living in lukewarmness? Very, very quickly, let me, let me give you three things. Three things, very quick. Here they are. Number one, when you fear others more than you fear God. Boy, we live in a society where we, we're just trying to please everybody, aren't we? I mean, you put stuff on Facebook, nobody friends you, you get your feelings hurt. People ask, you know, you put your opinion on there, and then people start complaining because you put your opinion on it. I'm going to tell you something. This is, this is what I try to avoid with all of my heart. When you come into this place, the last thing you need to know is my opinion. I don't want to give you, my opinion don't mean a hill of beans. What I want to give you is the word of God. Somebody say amen, amen. amen. But I mean, everybody's giving their opinion. And, uh, and, we, and we, we want to please, I want you to listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. You will never please everybody. Can I get an amen? All right. Quit trying. Listen. I heard Danny say this to SWAT team a couple of weeks ago, and I thought it was so good. He said, uh, and he was telling the guys, he said, guys, listen, the, the SWAT team was up there. And he said, first of all, he said, you're not, you're not celebrities, uh, you're servants. And I thought that was good. You're not celebrities, you're servants. And then he said this, he said, listen, you're not going to please everybody. Everybody's not going to like your performance. Everybody's not going to like your solo and all that. But he said this. He said, if you please God, it doesn't matter who you displease. But if you displease God, it don't matter who you please. Well, that was good, right? Come on. Somebody tweet that, right? I'll give it to you again. Somebody put that on Facebook. Come on. You put everything else on there. Uh, you know, you, you, put, you put what you ate last night. We don't care what you ate last night. 
Put, put, your, put your there. Yeah, my brother. If you please God, it don't matter who you displease. But if you displease God, it don't matter who you please. I, 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 I told Danny, I said, Danny, that was awesome. He said, well, I didn't get it. I got it from Adrian Rogers. I said, well, Adrian Rogers got it from somebody. Uh, he got it from me. But anyway, so, uh, no, not really. But, but it was awesome to think, you're not going to please everybody. Don't try to please everybody. Come on, please God. And all God's people said. Now, here's the deal. The last one is uh, if you, uh, you try to please everybody, but, here, but you know you're living in indifference. And I want you to get this. When, you, uh, when the things you used to could do by the Spirit, now you can do it with the flesh. Yeah. Now, think about that. This is especially true for those of you that are servants in this church. Those of you on the fit team, Sunday school, Awanas, on the praise team, in the choirs, in the orchestra, whatever you may be. Do you remember when you first taught that class? Do you remember when you first sung that solo? Do you remember when they first gave you an orange or a purple shirt? Do you remember how you felt? I guarantee the first thing out of your mouth, man, I can't do this. I'll pray about it. But you had to really rely on the Holy Spirit, didn't you? But now after a while, what happens? Yeah, I got this. Go, you know, go, go to somebody. I, I know what I'm supposed to do. I got it. No, no, no. You never get to that place. Come on, listen to me. You better take heed. Where you think you stand, you're going to fall. How many of you believe that? And then lastly, you know you live in league warmness. When... Uh, when you only pray to Jesus, when you need Jesus. That's a big one. You know what I call that? I call that spare tire Jesus. When you got a spare tire in your car, more than likely, you don't even know it's there. And you're probably thinking about it now that I mentioned it. And you don't know it's there. You know, life goes on. And let's face it, life for most of us goes on, same old, same old. Just kind of like driving and you go along. But when you have a flat, then you're aware if you need a spare tire, you're aware you pop the trunk, but here's the problem with that. You drive along, you drive along. And if you have spare tire Jesus in your life, when you pop open the trunk, you got to familiarize yourself with that stuff. I mean, I got to read the instructions again. I don't know where that little donut tire is. I got to get the jack out. How do you lose it? Does it go this way? Does it go that way? You're not familiar with it. Well, that's the way a lot of you are with spare tire Jesus. You just go on your life. You don't talk to him. You don't, you don't read your Bible. You don't say your prayers. You know he's around, but you don't need him. But when life goes flat, then you want to pop up in the trunk. Then you want to look at Jesus. And if he ain't there, you think God doesn't love you. You think he doesn't care about you. And the problem is you're not familiar with him. So why don't you avoid that and just walk with Jesus every moment of every day? Can I get an amen on that? That'll, that'll take care of that familiarity with Jesus. Why don't you do that? When you fail to do that, when you only call on Jesus, when you need him, you're breaking his heart. That's lukewarm. That's lukewarm. Now, what's the way out? What's the way out? Well, if you've been in church any length of time, uh, you know what I'm going to say. First of all, read your Bible. Now, let me say something about reading your Bible. When you're a lukewarm Christian, reading your Bible don't do you a whole lot of good. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible's a spiritual book, and it will not unlock its message unless you're spiritual. Amen. And if you're lukewarm, and you can take or leave Jesus, and you have a whatever attitude, go ahead and open your Bible. You ain't going to get anything out of it. But it's a good place to start. Read your Bible. And you're gonna say, you know I'm going to say, say your prayers. Pray. And then come to church. Now, you know all of that. You know those three things. But I want to challenge you with something that I was challenged with when I started listening to this message and hearing this message and studying this message. And that's this. Yeah, read your Bible, say your prayers, come to church. But more important than that, every day, if you want to get out of lukewarmness, every single day, stretch yourself and do something by faith. Do something by faith every single day. Now, for some of you, it's different than others. For some of you, it may be you need to help somebody. You, you, need, to be, you need to be aware of, of needs around you, and you need to help somebody. 
Uh, for some of you, uh, it may be, and this is a big one, would you listen? It may be you need to forgive somebody that, doesn't, that you don't think deserves forgiveness. That's going to stretch you. For some of you, it may be giving. You, you've never, you've never given. You, you've never get anything that didn't cost you something. And, and you never practice tithing. You never practice percentage giving. And, so, and some of you need to do that. And that's something you gotta, you gotta deal with every single day. For some of you, it may be pray out loud. For some of you, it may be gathering your kids together and they've never heard you pray out loud. For some of you, you need to do that. I don't know what it may be for others, for what, but every single day, you need to stretch yourself. Do something that you can't explain. Do something beyond yourself. Because let me tell you why I said that. Because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever you think this church is, this is a faith ministry. And when God blesses us, he blesses us when we step out on faith. How many believe that? Say a big amen. Amen. Last Sunday. Boy, I, I, we had nobody lined up for baptism. But I told the staff, I'm, I'm just going to preach on Baptism, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna tell people to get up right where they are. And Steph said, "Well, we don't have anybody lined." I said, "I don't know." I, I, they said, "Well, how many do you think will come?" I said, I don't, "I don't know if anybody will come. Could be nobody. Could be one. Could be." And I, I remember saying this: "It could be ten. And if you'd have read my journal, it's at about six thirty on Sunday morning. In my in my prayer time, I said, Jesus, I'm going out on a limb. I don't know if anybody's going to respond to this message, but I do think you want me to preach this message. So the results are going to be up to you. And boy, look what God did. And then it reminded me, ladies and gentlemen, we are to step out on faith. How many of you know results are always up to God? And all God's people said, but don't be afraid. That, that is the greatest thing in this world that will get you out of spiritual indifference. Challenge yourself. Do something tomorrow. Talk to somebody. Share your story. In a couple of months, we're going to give you a tool of how you can invite people to church in a, in a little bit more effective way than what some of you are doing right now. But you're going to have to do it. And it's still going to require faith. Share your story with somebody. Listen, be so conscious. Find something every day that you do by faith. Have a Bible reading time, a prayer time. So, well, preacher, I, I just don't have time. Yeah, you do. 24 hours every day, everybody's got it. But if you don't take time, you won't make it. Get up 10 minutes early. Come on. You don't, that beauty, I'm looking down at you right now. That beauty sleep ain't doing you any good. So get up. Get up 10 minutes earlier. Spend some time with God. Do something that'll stretch you by faith. Listen what the answer was. What was the answer to this? When Jesus said to the lukewarm church, you're lukewarm, you're doing nobody any good. You're not hot, you're not cold, you're not refreshing people, you're not healing people. Look at verse 19, listen to what he said. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Don't, don't shy away from the chastening hand of God, it just means you're a child of God. I don't, I don't, I don't discipline my next door neighbor's kids, but I discipline my own. So God says, listen, you need to understand this. Yes, I'm giving you a rebuke and I am chastising you, but don't give up because listen to what he said. He said, therefore, be zealous and repent. Everybody's wanting revival. Everybody keeps saying, you know what America needs, Pastor? America needs revival. And I agree with that, but let me remind you, the height of our revival will only go as high as the depth of our confession of sin. Amen. Oh, that was, that was a lot better than y'all thought it was. The height of revival will only go as high as the depth of the confession of our sin. He said, be zealous and repent. Don't be afraid to repent. Don't be afraid to admit it. Don't be afraid to own up to it. Then as he said, listen, very famous verse of scripture that we use in evangelistic services. Nothing wrong with that. It's just taken out of context when we do. Because he's not talking to lost people. He's not talking to your lost neighbors. 
He's not talking to your lost mom and daddy. He's talking to a church. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him. And I'll have fellowship with him and him with me. I'll restore the relationship. You would think, out of everything that God has given us, and we roll our eyes and we look at our watch like some of you are doing right now, and if I were you, I would not take one look at my watch right now. You would think, as much as Jesus has done for us, we roll our eyes and say, let's get this done with. Let's get church over with. I got things to do. You would think he would say to all of us, forget you. I'll go to somebody else. But he doesn't. He never does. His answer to spiritual indifference is to let us know he's knocking on our heart's door. And he wants to come in. But you got to invite him and say, Jesus, I've been ignoring you. I've been indifferent to you. I've been aloof to you. But you never left me. You never forsook me. And you're still in my heart. You're still wanting to come in and restore this fellowship that I used to have with you. What an awesome God we have.